Look, I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast. My name is Steve. Hey, I'm Chris, and I'll just say hi for Jesse because he's going to make it awkward. So. <laughs> I, I feel like there was no... I was looking at a different screen. Did you give like a silent countdown or something? Usually, you just started. Says, you just jumped right in. Jumped right in. Okay, this is episode ninety something. We're good. 90. Are we? Well, no, I think this is eighty nine. But no, no, we're uh, the nineties. Are we? Yeah, yeah. We Speaking are. Speaking of the nineties, episode ninety two. Let's 19. talk about some movies from the nineties. <laughs> Well, welcome everyone <laughs> to the premier geology podcast, the Geology Final Cast. Thanks everyone for for joining us. I like uh, how you ended that. You're like the premier geology podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, welcome. Thank you everybody for for joining the Geology Final Cast this week. We mm -hmm. will be talking about. A little topic in geology called snowball earth this week you may have heard of it you may have not have heard of it if you've it's never heard about baby it, there you go it's 19 yeah that's a probably 1980s reference right there no that's uh, that came Come out on, buddy. that came out in 88 i'm telling you right now oh i'm telling you uh, anyway carry on vanilla you're fact checking it right now i'll, I'll yeah. stall i'll stall i'm telling you right now that's 89 89 from the album hooked <sighs> It was also it won the People's Choice Award for favorite new song. Ed won the '80s award. I don't everything about the '80s. All right, <laughs> I apologize. I really thought it was '90s, but so close. That was off by a few months. Sorry. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if this is the first time you're joining the Geology Flannel Cast. You will learn that we have a giant appreciation for the 1990s. Everything about the 1990s <laughs> and some fact, of the '80s for Steve some of us older folk. Steve is wearing a shirt, a t-shirt right now from a defunct video rental store from the 1990s West Coast video for the, we're learning it wasn't even on the West Coast. It was pretty mostly much just, on the East Coast, just, just an East Coast thing on. Anyways, we are getting so far away from the topic. Yes. Snowball Earth. Snowball Earth. All right. What's uh, cooler than being cool? Ice cold. <laughs> Come on. That's an Atlanta reference right there. You should know that. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about, but oh, it's outcast. What? Yeah. Oh, Alcast could be the, any of those. Any one of those guys could be like the mayor of Atlanta right now, or like <laughs> the patron saint of a of Atlanta. Well, so in case you don't know what Snowball Earth is, let's just. I guess we could just start off with uh, starting off with like a brief summary. Basically, it's this time period. It's it's a really crazy time period. It's like long ago in Earth's history, we're long, we're talking like seven like seven hundred, six hundred million years ago during pre-Cambrian time, and there's there's some evidence of basically the earth freezing over and hence the name snowball earth. And so kind of a little synopsis on, on what we hope to cover today. Well, we'll get into it definitely, but like, you know, how did this happen? What, what could have caused snowball earth? What were, you know, what's like the lines of evidence that we have that the earth froze over, not we as in the flannel casters, but we as like other geologists out there have found. I'm old, but not that old. That was, <laughs> And then, uh, you know, and then like we'll get into what what could have uh, what could have uh, stopped this snowball earth thing from happening. So um, that's the game plan for today. What we hope to cover with with this episode of the geology file cast episode number 92. So um, I guess we could start off with the origins of of snowball earth. So this is this is something that's uh yeah, like I said, this is a really extraordinary claim saying that the entire earth froze over. So we have all this, all this evidence and all this data from, uh, you know, like the, especially like the, the previous the, uh, five glacial glaciations from the Pleistocene where, you know, we, we have, we know, we can see like the, the, the end moraines, we know how far the ice went and we have a pretty good idea of what those conditions were like during, during the, the ice ages, during the Pleistocene. And this snowball earth stuff is going to make the pleistocene ice ages look like amateur hour this is like some heavy duty freezing of the earth so it all starts off with uh let's go back to like the 1960s right and so this is like we're talking Sno snowball earth was not in the 1960s but no, carry on the, the, thank you it's <laughs> did not happen in the 1960s 
but some people started thinking about it in the 1960s. It started seeing some 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 weird stuff. So to give you a uh, well, I mean, even before that. Okay. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Look at. We just had an episode on Wagner, and he was looking at. Yeah. Glacial <laughs> stuff across. Well, okay. So <clears throat> what I found. All right, let me hear you found. <laughs> <laughs> say it with contempt <laughs> all right so, fine I think, so I think ultimately we're going to be in agreement after you yes. let me finish what i'm going to say here but... <laughs> you finish, finish what you're going to say no you go first we'll go in chronological order so go ahead. okay that's well, that's back. what i thought okay yeah. i i didn't want to jump around here but i mean so the idea of of glacial episodes in the um Precambrian, so early Earth. What would you call that? Proterozoic. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> That's the eon. Yeah. 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 So, yes. like th- this idea of like really old ice ages. There's evidence for it <clears throat> in the in these early attempts at like uh, geologic dating, right? So, like in the 1800s, in the 19th century is when we develop the geologic time scale, which we've talked about before, based on fossil layers and using stratigraphy, no absolute, no numerical dating. And so some of these early researchers in doing that recognized that really low in the record, this really proterozoic time period, eon, you have glaci- gl- evidence of glaciers in, <clears throat> there's evidence that's been noted um, in the 1800s by people in Scotland, Australia, India, Norway. But the understanding of those events and how they were were not connected was limited because Alfred Wegener had not come onto the scene yet, our understanding of continental drift. So part three of our plate tectonics miniseries continues today. an early proponent, I just, this is just sort of a, a side side note, an early proponent of, <clears throat> of this global, this idea of global glaciation, that all of these proterozoic glaciations, glacial evidence were, were connected was uh, a researcher by the name of uh, Douglas Malson, Sir Douglas Malson. Um, <clears throat> Dougie M to his friends. Yeah. He, he knew a thing or two about glaciers and glaciations because he was a main participant with Shackleton on his ill-fated Ar- Antarctic expedition. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, fun fact. He was on the Nimrod. It's a great so, name. <laughs> yeah. So is, this it, I, is, is that where the derogatory connotation of that name came from? I don't think so because i feel like i think i know where it came from i think it actually came from bugs bunny so isn't the story that i heard and i don't know if this is true or not maybe we can fact check this you know right now on the show but the story that i had heard was bugs bunny used to call elmer fudd nimrod because nimrod was a great biblical hunter yeah and he was using it ironically right ah. and he's like oh come on nimrod and um uh, that. that's when it started to become like you know no, i like i could bust. totally buy that i can totally what buy i'm that. seeing here it so, is okay it is from bugs bunny well yeah it means a yeah the skillful masterful hunter but yeah okay bugs <clears throat> used its bugs and daffy used it sarcastically with elmer fudd there was <clears throat> there was a there was a guy in growing up in my town whose name was elmer fudd no stop it and Why? people used to kids used to just crank call him all the time <sighs> I, he put his phone number in the phone book uh, we'll hunt the <laughs> rabbits yeah. did he yeah. yeah if he had like a lisp or something that would be just like, uh, yeah. could, couldn't pronounce his r's that would be it yeah, yeah that would be <laughs> just the the you know but so, yes so there was evidence of these super old glaciations yeah like, and you, like you would two find, billion year old glaciations yeah so you find this evidence but the, the part of the issue was sort of connecting it and you know so it's it's an idea that just sort of lingers it's lingering out there until the 1960s well 
so <laughs> yes, to piggyback off of this, um, there was a, a geologist by the name of W. Brian Harland at the University of Cambridge and you know, started to find these glacial deposits uh, from the Neo-Proterozoic uh, on just about every continent. So all, all over the place. So the Neo-Proterozoic is the last era in the, in the Proterozoic um, eon, Precambrian time. So he starts finding all this stuff. Um, and what he figures, and now keep in mind, it's like I said, this is like the 1960s. And this is just as plate tectonics is starting to kind of, kind of come about. And you know, there's still a lot of people that are kind of skeptical about plate tectonics, you know, but what Harlan kind of hypothesizes is that the continents had clustered together near, near the equator. Right. And this ended up being what he ended up what he ended up hypothesizing ended up being the supercontinent known as Rodinia. So we've talked about Rodinia a few times on the the flannel cast, but uh, just to give you guys a quick little, you know, 10 second uh, summary of what Rodinia was. Rodinia was a supercontinent came together about ish a billion years ago and broke up about between 750 and 633 million years ago. All right. And Rodinia is Russian, meaning to give birth. Hmm. You know that guys know that. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, or it also means uh, motherland or birthplace. Huh. Yeah. You know, I always enjoy hearing uh, you know, the origin of these these words. You know, so many times we hear these words in geology or just science in general. You know, and like that's. What you know? Why would anyone name this? Like, yeah, you, I thought it was you don't even think about named it. after the uh, '70s sitcom Rhoda, but I was wrong. <laughs> I don't even know what that is, so we'll just move on. <laughs> uh, to so, be young like Chris, <laughs> not that young. Um, uh, all right. So uh, Hallard kind of says, you know, he thinks that these continents were clustered together at the very end of Precambrian time, basically, and uh, looks at the magnetic orientation of some of these uh, magnetic minerals that were you know, involved with these glacial deposits. And he notices that they are near horizontal, okay? The way they're oriented is near horizontal, which indicates like on the equator, okay? So when you think about the magnetic field, so these, these magnetic uh, minerals will orient themselves uh, you know, when, when um, they'll, they'll orient themselves along with the magnetic field. Okay? And he says they're horizontal. And if they're hard, the only time that these grains are be horizontal is when they're near the equator, because if they're at the polar regions, they'd be vertical, like kind of like sticking or pointing towards the inside of the earth. And that's the way that the earth's magnetic field is oriented, right? So that's what he uses. And there was, there was a lot of like speculation with that as well. Like, oh, I don't know if this method actually works and you know, whatever, but. Um, and, and I mean, this, this is pretty early on in <clears throat> paleomagnetism because paleomagnetism is one of the things that was the main line of evidence for C4 spreading and continental yeah. drift. So, so he's really taking this idea. <clears throat> he's tying together these concepts. He's, you know, using this idea of how the earth evolved, but <clears throat> you know, unlike so the idea here would be you know maybe we're just seeing glaciation on all of these continents because they were a supercontinent uh, um <clears throat> and maybe that supercontinent was was over a pole which would be cold and that, that's what we see in gondwana um <clears throat> in the late uh paleozoic we see sort of at the end of I guess the Carboniferous and, and the Permian, you have a big glaciation. And it's because most of the, most of Gondwana was over the South Pole. So it's just cold. But in this case, there's a disconnect where he's seeing all of these horizontal uh, magnetic grains, right. Right. which yeah. suggests tropical. Yeah, it's, it's, equatorial equatorial hmm. and so what he's saying and then these these, these are associated with these glacial deposits so what homeboy's saying is these glacial deposits 
or in tropical conditions. And here's where the, uh, the main line of speculation came in, um, is that other geologists were saying, how do you get glaciers in hot comets? Comets? Well, climates, excuse me. Cool. <laughs> I guess climates and com or, uh, <laughs> comets. Comets, good. How, how do you yeah, have a hot yeah, comet yeah. either? You yeah. can't have a hot comet. Uh, so how do we get glaciers in hot climates? All right. Because we never seen that. Like I said, we, we it's it's relatively straightforward looking at the Pleistocene glaciations. You just look for the end moraines, I guess, you know, and that's how you can tell how far down the glaciers went. But they didn't go anywhere near the, you know, tropical climates. Like, for example, during the, the Wisconsin Ice Age, which was the most recent uh, Ice Age, during its maximum, the glaciers went down to, like, New Jersey and Pennsylvania on the East Coast. Yeah, not even, like, you, northern Jersey. Yeah, so they yeah. Get down to Long, Long Island. Like, like 40 degrees. That's, de what's that's what the Long moraine. Island Long is. Island's yeah. the moraine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 40 degrees north latitude is sort but, of the extent. But to put it in perspective, that was 18,000 years ago. We're talking about six over 600 million years ago. So there's seven, a lot of weathering, seven, a, seven, lot, yeah. a lot of recycling, a lot of, a lot of evidence is being removed from this crime scene. So yeah. it's, it's much harder to put up, pull it all back together. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's Steve had a great point. The, the further away in time you are, the less resolution we have on what happened. And yeah, I think this is going to be a a point of contention to this day is sort of the timing and, and you know, the evidence is so spread out and being able to date or, or put times on on the evidence makes makes it very speculative in certain aspects. Yeah, sure. anytime you're dealing with Precambrian geology, it's uh, it's just tricky. It's tricky. It's so yeah, it, old. it's almost like planetary geology too. It's like, okay, prove me wrong. Well, <laughs> I can't because I can't find another rock that this old is this old. Like it's it's hard. So real fast to go off topic for a second. Mm. What? And I, I don't know. If you we got to stay on script, buddy. Come I don't on. know if you guys have an answer for this, and I'm not really expecting you guys to have an answer for this. I looked at Jesse had mentioned Gondwana. Uh, What's the origin of that name? Ooh, that's. I looked it. I couldn't find it. I there, I bet you there's a really cool story where that name comes from. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it's uh, oh Edward. Oh, Edward. I, I see it right now. Actually, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. In the big, in the big subheading of name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Edward Suisse, um, the Australian, Australian, Austrian geologist who uh, an expert on all things alpine, including alpine glaciers. Um, <clears throat> he, yeah, based this on a lot of the evidence was from the central uh, Gondwana region of India which <clears throat> derives its name from Sanskrit for forest of Gons. And uh, <clears throat> that's uh, uh, an ethnic group in India. The Gons. Sweet. It had previously been used by others. H.B. Meldicott. Oh, that's interesting. The next line down, the term Gondwana land is preferred by some scientists in order to make a clear distinction between the region and the supercontinent. Yeah, I've always heard it called Gondwana land. I've yeah. heard people call Gondwana. I've heard, yeah, I've heard both names. I've heard both, and it's always confused me. But Gondwana no. land. Okay, oh, that, that's interesting. I, yeah, it's weird that it wasn't named after a 70s sitcom, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think the sitcom ALF was named after Alfred Wagner? Oh, yes. Actually, it stands for Alien Life Form, so no. That's but, what they I want think... you to think. <laughs> you think, you know, Wagner just came back from Greenland, like, who finally made it back. Like, oh, what is going on here? It's I all think, uh... oh, it's, it's all an allegory. Greenland was actually Melmac. Ooh. It's, Wagner was Alf. Mm -hmm. Wagner was and known to eat cats. Yeah, he only survived on cats because he was stranded. I, I it makes all, all make sense now. That's... I was thinking that uh, Gondwana was named after 
the uh, <laughs> such a bad job. I don't want to say this. <laughs> Due to the classic movie Gondwana with the wind. <laughs> Just... <laughs> All right. If I had the cricket noise, Chris, I'd be playing it now for you. Okay. Oh, that was a Steve joke if ever there was one. Come on, man. Gondwana in sixty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> marking that time down there oh yeah <laughs> yeah do some yeah. light editing yeah for our patreons you know this is the the secret look behind a curtain that you get to get <laughs> um to 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 the family and the state of alfred wegner i'd like to state that he did not eat cats as far as we know i don't want to badmouth him here he's they, he's they are delicious he is a fan of the podcast so he is all right. <laughs> so, yes, mo- multiple lines of evidence showing that the planet was indeed uh, had some ice at some equatorial locations. Well, yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, the, this is going to be sort of the rub here is <clears throat> is proving that there was ice <clears throat> at, at, in these tropical locations, because <clears throat> if you draw one of my favorite graphs to show this is insight into you know how how i live i have favorite graphs uh is you can plot up in the in the modern day and and you can actually extend it back through time depending on what the global climate was um your latitude versus elevation at which uh, uh you can have a glacier so where you where you you know the the elevation at which a glacier forms, and so you know at the poles glaciers form right at the surface, right at sea level, and the closer you get to essentially the equator, it's it, it makes just a, a a big half circle or a big parabola. Um, Close, the, closer to the what? At at the equator. Okay. What did I say? I say equator. You say at equator. A, equator. It's like uh, the, it's the electronic quater. That's, that's, <laughs> I'm trying to make it modern here. No, it's just an interesting pronunciation. <laughs> it's like saying the Caribbean versus Caribbean. I don't yeah. know. Just so people I think say I it say differently. Equator as well. Yeah, equator. So closer to the closer equator. To, Closer to zero degrees. Zero latitude. degrees latitude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. You, you need to get your elevation is like 20,000 feet because you can get glaciers. You can get glacial ice at, at or near zero like degrees the, latitude. Yeah. Top of volcanoes in like Hawaii or something. You're going to have some snow. Yeah. Mount Kilimanjaro. Yeah, or like, you know, stopping uh, Columbia or oh, there's, no, there's big mountains in Ecuador. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> um, Mount Kilimanjaro is at, I want to say, what is its latitude? It's like two. It's like two south or two north. It's, it's Mount, right. Yeah. And it's losing ice very fast. Too. It is. There's, and that's part of it. So the world is getting warmer. So uh, that elevation is going up. Um, mm. So yeah, Mount Kilimanjaro is at, at three degrees. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was that like, that's, that's pretty much smack dab on the equator. And so, yeah. So the idea of, of getting glacial ice at these elevations at at, at these latitudes isn't unknown. The thing here would be, these are not just these isolated glaciers. These are connected like ice sheets. This would be like, you know, the Laurentide ice sheet, or, you know, when you think of, the Wisconsin glaciation, like Chris was saying, you know, that that's in North America, there's two huge ice sheets covering the, the northern portions that are comparable to Antarctica. Like you're, you have these two, three, four mile thick sheets of ice that are huge lateral extent. And so that's, that's the idea here. <clears throat> I think the the point they're trying to, to get to is, yeah, these weren't just mountain glaciers. Yeah, that happened to be at low latitudes. These are ice sheets that covered the planet. These are like the Earth freezing. Well, I don't want to say freezing to the core. That's completely wrong to say that. <laughs> but like, like a hard, hard shell of ice. And it's, it's, yeah, this is get, it's getting pretty, 
This is like super glaciers, basically. Super glaciers is a great. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that would be a really good, like, B list '90s movie. Yes. Super, super glacier. Super glacier. You heard it first here at the Geology Flannel Cast. Super glacier copyright. Uh, four twenty-eight twenty-one, and the tagline is <clears throat> "frozen to the core." <laughs> so we can make it even more so, scientifically wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, we're, if we're gonna go for it, let's go for it. Well, where did this term "snowball Earth" come from? Who, who coined this term? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. There's a researcher at at Caltech named uh, Joe. Joe Kirschvink. And he speculated about this, coined the term, and then that's about it. 1992, he coined that term. Never. I, hey, he's been resting on his laurels ever since. This yeah. is like... A, Actually... I, oh, good. I was going to say, I, I've, I've read uh, 1989. Oh, so we're all... Yeah. Uh, Which article yeah. are you? Are you by any chance are you reading the Scientific American article? No, I'm reading the Astronomy.com article. Uh, oh, do you think? Do you think Joe was listening to Ice Ice Baby as he was coming <laughs> up with Snowball Earth? It was in so, 1989. Oh, ooh, maybe. So I'm uh, the article. I'm reading this interview with Paul Hoffman, who is um, he's basically the the champion of Snowball Earth. He he's spent the last 40 years of his life researching it and, and doing field work on it. And he was <clears throat> put onto it by, he had a car, he had a conversation with Joe Kirschvink and he's like, what are you, how are you studying this? And he said, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and so Paul this idea. was like, this is an incredible idea. Why isn't anyone doing anything about this? So, uh, also, it was a good day by Ice Cube came out in 1992. Ooh, so that was floating that one out there too, Steve. All right, oh, <laughs> have, have you seen the uh decision matrix diagram on it was a good day? No, no, oh, man, it's like a big giant poster. It's like, did, did mama cook breakfast with no hog? Yes, no, and then it's like. It was a good oh, day. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, I just I there's some funny songs here. I googled songs about ice. Google kicked out some good ones here. <laughs> um. Anyways, it's different uh, topic for a different podcast. There you X, go. X out of that one. All right. Um. So, uh, you say Nito, take your albedo and roll to the church in your new tuxedo. Oh, that's. You got the albedo in the young MC. So I have a, I just have uh, a, actually it's libido, not <laughs> albedo, but I have a, I do need to mention something. So we've all been working. We have this outline we're using. <clears throat> Boy, is it a mess. <laughs> <laughs> There's it, it is bullet not... points that are just different shapes. It's all over the place. I'm pretty sure you said billet points. It's not like shiny chrome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just, Jesse almost had me release my beverage through my nose. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, nice. You know, I, I don't know what you call that, but I call that a snarf <laughs> I don't know. When, when something almost comes out of your nose. Well, I'm gonna start anyway, using. yes, we, we could have a slightly more organized uh, outline if Perhaps we have the formatting formula. Look at this for us before we got to podcasting. Um, but let's talk about the formatting formula for a moment. So the formatting formula can help you out with all of your word documenting needs, including bullet points on your <laughs> outline for your flannel cast. We don't or, uh, underrated, underrated. Just mm -hmm. plop that text in there. <laughs> so, uh, uh, www.formattingformula.com or if you want to teach yourself you can go to youtube watch all their youtube videos they have like hours and hours and hours of youtube videos on how to do this stuff yourself not only is it is it well paced like let's face it i'm pretty computer illiterate but their pacing is so good on these youtube videos that i can 
keep up with it. But yes, I'm very computer illiterate. What's great about YouTube, you can pause it and you can try it. And then you can go back to the video and be like, hey, that did work. Okay, great. Now, what's next? Like, how do I... How do I insert hyperlinks? How do I format a table of contexts? How do I, how do I format my figures where if I have to add a figure, like I, I have figures one through 27, but I need to add now a figure at number 13, like the formatted formula will teach you how to do that. So then it, the, the, all the other future figures trickle down like w- way back in the day, I would be like, shoot, I need another figure. I'm going to call this one 13 a. <laughs> we'll get to fix that problem no the four form is like no stop that here this is how you do it this is how you fix it so please check them out formattingformula.com or youtube forward slash c forward slash formatting formula um they have a, a new website so check it out um but you know write them a little note on youtube or uh, write them a little note on their website saying hey geology flannel cast sent me what can you do for me so Check them out, formattingformula.com. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Check them out. Um, so let's uh, let's let's get into the, the nuts and bolts now. I think we have enough background information on Snowball Earth. We can actually jump into this and uh, yeah, stuff got cold. Down. Stuff <laughs> stuff got cold is right. So a lot of stuff we're dealing with happened during the Cryogenian period of. Uh, of the uh, Neo-Proterozoic era, which is in the Proterozoic eon of the unofficial Precambrian time. Uh, so, <clears throat> cryogen being very appropriate. Very appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, that, that naming worked out then. <laughs> Got really lucky. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to call this the Cryogen, turns out. Man, also- even, a, even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while, you know? <laughs> Where does the what's the root of cry, like cryogenic and cryo? What is the root? Old, of, right? Cry, yeah. yeah. What like what language? I mean, I'm guessing cryo Latin. Where does cryo come from? Is cryo is Greek. Cryo, Greek. For, I mean, Greek <laughs> comes from kuros, which means frost. Mm. Kuros. Kur- cryo. <laughs> cryo. Very good. All right. So. Uh, let me ask you guys. I saw there's there's like two major glaciations that occurred, but then I also saw some stories that said as many as four could have occurred. Yeah, I don't so, I don't know much about the the others. I think they're yeah, sort of speculative. But the, there's two major ones. Yeah, at least I mean, we can, I think we can get away with saying at least two major two major glaciations, right? <laughs> that's that's how I. So I write, write most of my research. I always put those qualifiers at least. At least. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're dealing with, um, I had the numbers, but uh, like, uh, I want to say like 600. The, the first one was like 730 million years ago. Uh, I, and I, I've seen 717. 717. And then 650. Yes. Um, 650. Yeah. Okay. So okay. seven. the first one was 717 to 642 they lasted like so each of these glacial periods lasted like 10 million years at least at least at least yeah at least. so the, the first is, one i think lasted longer right it did yeah yes. yeah um yeah. that's crazy like that's yeah. such a long amount of time yeah. for uh you know for an ice age uh what, ten, yeah that's, when you consider like the most recent ice ages <clears throat> yeah um during the Pleistocene, you know, <clears throat> there's been these advances in retreat. So these glacials and interglacials and the glacials are lasting a couple of thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, you know, at most. So to say 10 million years, the first one actually lasts 58 million. Yeah, that's right. That's, yeah. Yeah. And the, the second one is between five and 10, five and 15. And yeah, our, our current um, <clears throat> interglacial glacials are basically uh, the shortest cycles of the Milankovitch cycles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, for more on that, you can go to episode 34, uh, yeah. which is in 2015. But uh, so Milankovitch cycles basically have to do with how the planet is orbiting around the sun. 
how it's it's tilting, how the orbit shape changes, um, all that stuff. Basically, you know, the further you are away from the sun, the colder it's going to be. The more you're tipped away from the sun, whether you're in the northern or southern hemisphere, the colder it's going to be. So, yeah. but this yeah. these these millions and millions of year cycles do not fall into those Milankovitch cycles. Yeah, that's. I yeah, mean, this is the, next level. Milankovitch super glaciers. Yeah, super glaciers. The periodicity of <clears throat> so Milankovitch the three cycles. Um, you know, August is what four hundred thousand years. What's that? Uh, eccentricity. Yeah, so the orbits four hundred and one hundred are the two cycles. Um, <clears throat> tilt is 40, 40. Yeah, forty, and then obliquity. Or no, sorry, excuse me. Precession is twenty one. 19, yeah. 19 and 21 or something. So you can imagine adding all those numbers up and every once in a while, all of them would combine to be like a super cold period. But so, even, even in that, you're not talking millions of years. You're talking hundreds of thousands of years, maybe at, at, at most not, no, not even hundreds of thousands, like tens of thousands. So it, 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 it leads to the question, what's the deal? Yeah why so why so cold uh so like what so if it's not milenkovich we're yeah were we like pluto were we way out there in the solar system what the hell happened? <laughs> sorry what the so heck happened we we know we know it's not milenkovich and we we've already we've already told you that the continents are at the equator so uh what what caused this why why how do we get super glacier in our what's the major plot element of our movie well mm. there's happy you asked that jesse i'm pretty sure it's a sharknado but carry there, on there are three there's three variables three very large variables that we we can look at to have caused this okay so number one is the carbon cycle you guys ever heard of this the carbon cycle i don't believe it <laughs> <laughs> so all right so Here's the carbon cycle just talks about how carbon goes through, goes through these cycles, right? Uh, in the atmosphere and out of the atmosphere, you know, um, it's, it's not good when you define the term by saying the, the cycle, carbon cycle is, is when, carbon when carbon goes, goes through cycles. Thank, thank <laughs> so uh, we start off to explain what we're talking about here to, to kind of keep this simple so that everybody can understand. We got volcanoes erupting. All right. The volcanoes are going to emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. When you get more carbon, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. The more carbon dioxide you get in the atmosphere, it's going to warm up the climate, basically. So carbon dioxide is warming up the earth. And then what happens is that carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere can get pulled out in during weathering and they get stored in carbonate rocks. And that's going to cool down the earth. So we have this balance uh, basically between volcanic eruptions and weathering. All right. So that's going on and that's keeping everything in the balance. And that keeps the earth in this happy medium, like for like temperature wise, it's almost like this like thermostat for the earth, you could say, but here's what happens. And we, you know, we fast or we talk about, we had the supercontinent Rodinia. Rodinia is hanging out on the equator, right? We had the batteries charged for the equator. <laughs> uh, and Rodinia is breaking up, right? Rodinia is like, you know what? I'm sorry. It's just, it's just not working out for us. And I think we're just, we're just better off as friends. All right. So Rodinia <laughs> starts breaking up. <laughs> um, so it starts going its own separate ways. And what ends up happening is associated with this rifting that breaks up Rodinia is these lava flows of basalt. Well, <clears throat> go ahead. I was going to say, so <clears throat> one of the things when Rodinia breaks up, so when you have a supercontinent, <clears throat> one thing that we anticipate happening, <clears throat> and we sort of see it today on earth with our, with some of the bigger continents is that on the interior of those continents, they're essentially really dry because your moisture is coming from the ocean. 
evaporating and the clouds move on to land and it rains and so on and so forth. The further away you get from a moisture source, the drier it is. Sort of makes sense. So if you have a supercontinent, you have all the land masses together, the interior of that land mass is, is likely going to be pretty arid. And so if you break up this land mass, you're now creating all of this coastline. You're, you're, you're creating ocean basins when you, when you break up a supercontinent. And so <clears throat> you're now um, <clears throat> having all of this precipitation on these interior parts of the continent that hadn't weathered at all in millions of years. And so you start this process of pretty intense weathering, which, which we just said draws down CO2, which the, the so, <clears throat> you know, that that's one aspect of, of the, the, the split up here. I just wanted to tie it in because yeah. you had said about the yeah, yeah. CO2 drawdown. That's yeah, that's great. And so also on top of that, of all that, that's rock that hasn't been weathered in a really, really long time. We're also sitting on the equator mm. and the equator, you're going to get a lot of chemical weathering at the equator. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> it's <laughs> hot and uh, wet at the equator because you're <clears throat> evaporating a lot of moisture. It's very bad for electronics it is so it's, it's sort of a paradox there <laughs> the equator where yeah. electronics go to die <laughs> yeah um so what's happening is that's causing uh the weathering to happen even faster than normal all right um so you know we haven't we're, it's it's like like Jesse said we're having this intense pull out of CO2 of the of the atmosphere faster than the volcanoes can spit the CO2 back into the atmosphere. All right. Um, another factor we can get into is the uh, the sun was a little bit dimmer than it is today, about seven percent dimmer during the cryogenian period than it is today. And you might think like seven percent that's really not that much, but that's that's enough that can yeah. you know it's uh, just to put it put it in perspective that uh our co2 levels i don't know what 50 years ago we we're like 300 parts per million now we're above 400 parts per million yeah we're well above 400 now so we're yeah. talking uh when you say parts per million you need 10,000 parts per million to be one percent so we're talking a tiny per proportion of one percent of the atmosphere being increased and it's totally throwing off global climate so yeah. for the sun to be seven percent different than what it is now that's a huge deal that'll get We're, you to where you're trying to go that's well <clears throat> to to tie it back i don't know what episode but just for reference <clears throat> in 1992 <laughs> when, I, listen this this is pretty much referenced in most episodes but carry on <laughs> when mount pinatubo erupted uh it, it spit out you know sulfates which we'll talk about here in a second and and ash and dust which dims dim the earth because it blocks sunlight it dimmed fractions of a percent that was enough to be noticeable, cooled the earth off by a degree or so. And Jesse didn't swim. I didn't swim all summer. It was too cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, but, I, we have Jesse on record saying, I don't have my hard drive hooked up right now, but we have <laughs> Jesse on record saying that at no point did he not swim less. No point did he swim less. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. This, is a, this is a bone of contention between Jesse and one of our Patreons. But, His uh, brother. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was just trying to put a plug in for our Patreons, but yeah. Uh, but I also love that in our outline, it's called dim sum. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me hungry. It's delicious. <laughs> yeah. So good. Okay. So plowing ahead. So Ooh. the sun's the sun is was that uh, a snow pun. Was that a glacier yeah. pun? Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're, we're getting through this topic slowly. I <laughs> <laughs> okay so <laughs> the sun's a little dimmer so it's not it's it's not heating the earth as much as it would today basically um now 
uh, but we there's uh, the third line of evidence is this thing called the Franklin Large Igneous Province, right? Now that's in northern Canada, and it's a big, big slab of a slab. That's probably not the best word to use, but it's this this big area of these basalt flows, and so these eruptions started about 18 million years before the glaciation started. Like I said, huge volcanic eruptions. There's about a thousand square kilometers of basalt up there in northern Canada. And so here's the deal with these um, with these eruptions, right? I know we said that the volcanic eruptions are going to eventually uh, warm up the climate by putting CO2 in there, but these basalts have a ton of sulfur in them, okay? So usually what ends up happening is these volcanic eruptions, they release sulfur into the atmosphere, and that's the sulfur in the atmosphere is going to cool, cool down the earth, but it has a short residence time. And residence time just means like how long that stuff hangs out in the atmosphere for it before it eventually comes out. And what eventually happens is that sulfur turns into sulfuric acid and then falls out of the atmosphere as acid rain. Fun stuff, right? But these eruptions were huge and they lasted over years and years and years and years. Um, and they were called fire fountains. They were huge. And what it did was it kicked sulfur gas up about 12 kilometers into the atmosphere. And so what happened is because it, it, it spit out that sulfur so high up into the atmosphere, it took a lot longer for this to fall out. And so it had, it, it, it had more of an effect long-term for, for the climate. So that's essentially those three those three, uh, those three variables there kicked off the first glacial, uh, the first glaciation, all right? And, or the yeah, so they they start, yeah, the glaciation. So this start is at higher latitude. It cools off the earth so that higher latitudes start freezing up. So closer to the poles, it makes it cold enough now that you're getting ice sheet development at high latitudes and the ice keeps growing and, and these all of these things combined are cooling off the planet enough or blocking enough sunlight that it cools off and, the, and again at, at this point we don't know about ocean currents or like ha how the how the temperature is being regulated across the planet we don't have any yeah. evidence to 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 figure out how delicate the balance of temperature distribution is yeah <clears throat> And plus, this also happened like 700 plus million years ago as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that too. Uh, there's that little fact too. Um, all right. So what ends up happening is we get we start getting ice growth, right? Like ice sheets growing. Now, the other kicker is here's the fourth variable involved with these major, um, with this, like the, with these super glaciers, as we, as we were calling them. Ice starts to grow and grow and grow and grow. And then it gets to the point that it reaches 30 degrees latitude. Now, this is not today. This is about where New Orleans is today. All right. And this is where you start to hit this runaway effect. All right. So what ends up happening is we have this thing called the albedo effect. And light materials reflect the sunlight back and dark materials absorb it, right? So at this point now, we have a crap ton of ice and it starts reflecting all that energy back um, that the sun brings in. And we get this run, at, at this point now, once it reaches this 30 degrees latitude, we get this runaway effect where there's just so much of this albedo effect that the ice just keeps on growing and growing and growing and growing. And it's, like I said, it's a it's runaway effect and just like, it's almost out of control. And boom, there you have it. That's like kind of like the, the I guess you could say the final nail in the coffin. There you go. Yeah. And the more <laughs> ice you have, the whiter the planet is, the more it reflects the heat back out into space. The it's colder, colder it which means more snow, which means more <clears throat> reflection, which means more snow, which means more reflection. You know, and this is my, uh, this is my core's light. 
can hypothesis. You know, I also I want to take a second and I, you know, there's a there's a misnomer out there, and I didn't learn this until we were talking with our with our Patreon friends before the episode started. There's there's this misnomer out there that it's it can get too cold to snow. And I didn't know, and we we looked this up, and thanks to Maddie, one of our good Patreon friends, she she was telling we told us that there is actually it can't be too cold to snow. Which you know, I'd always heard that there was you know it can get too cold to snow, but no, it's uh that's that's a misnomer. So I guess it be could be too cold for water to evaporate into the atmosphere. Yeah, too cold to snow a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because like Antarctica is technically a and- desert based on its annual precipitation so how how cold did it get like what's uh, cooler than being cool (laughs) what i I, so you you threw out a number before we went on i've seen i've seen annual temperatures or uh, annual average temperatures on earth of negative 20 celsius which negative 20 celsius is 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 an interesting number because um negative 20 is essentially what the temperature would be on earth today without the greenhouse effect interesting because when you look it up i mean i the numbers that i was seeing i I found numbers as low as negative 50 yeah 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 yeah, minor in celsius too which i believe you know negative 20 celsius is is zero degrees fahrenheit um Which is cold, like it's too cold, and that's the mean temperature on Earth. Yeah. So what's even crazier is because it's the mean temperature, you think that you know parts of the Earth or half of the Earth was warmer, <laughs> and half the Earth was colder. This, this, this is probably the mean temperature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like the warm parts but, are probably like yeah, zero C. But yeah. but here's the deal. But you said it's colder than. What 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 would what, you say a without ago? the greenhouse effect? Without the greenhouse effect, Ooh. but we're reflecting all yeah. that heat back. Yeah. Plus, uh, CO two has been drawn down so much. Yeah. So we're we're losing that. So, and what did you you said negative fifty? Yeah. Ooh, that's cold. That is uncomfortably cold. Yeah. I mean, I like it cold, but even that's pushing it. It's negative 74 uh, uh, Fahrenheit. Negative 50 Celsius is negative 58. What am I seeing? It says here negative 74 Fahrenheit. I mean, like, Check. this is the website that I've... Oh, I just Googled negative 50 C to... Uh, well, yeah, I believe that right. over anything else, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What it, what's, the, what's the temperature when they're the same? Negative 32, I think it is. Huh. Negative... Well, how about that? That website is incorrect, and I will not be using that website anymore. <laughs> <laughs> is that correct? Negative 32? Uh, no. Negative 40. They're exactly the same. Because it's you multiply the Celsius by nine-fifths, and then you add 32. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. Nine-fifths. Um, nine-fifths. What, what a good system. What a good system we've yeah, got. Fahrenheit. Yay. <laughs> so, so one of the... Real fast about this, I, I just want to say this one, one more fun fact about albedo and we'll just move on. Yeah. Uh, ice reflects 55 to 80% of, of incoming light. Yeah. All right. Al who? Uh, albedo. Mr. Albedo. Um, ocean water reflects 12% and land reflects 10 to 40%, depending on where you're at. So yeah. obviously, yeah, obviously, if you're like a lush ice. green forest, you're going to reflect almost nothing. If you're a desert with just white sand, you're going to reflect a lot. It's, it's why if you walk through a grass field versus walking through a blacktop parking lot. Yeah. You know, the parking lot is super hot because it's absorbing most of that sunlight. Whereas, you know, even just the grass. <clears throat> field it's, it's you get some reflection going on there so this thing was so cold that there's some some numbers to throw some more numbers out there <laughs> that the you're ocean... about to set up a joke there this was so How cold, cold was it? 
There, the ice, the oceans were covered with as much as a kilometer thick layer of ice. Whoa, I did not know that. That's like, yeah, I, I've heard that too. But super I've heard glaciers. that. Super glaciers. I'm telling you guys, super, super glaciers. glaciers. I, I've heard that disputed to. Um, well, oh, you want to well, dispute this because that's the that's the topic we can get into. Yeah, because yeah, like salt oh. water. First of all, salt water. It just has a colder temperature, colder freezing temperature. Right. Well, and you get re- you get brine rejection and then it concentrates more and more salts. And yeah, which means it's harder and harder to freeze. But you so. get a lot of ocean water and how like the ocean, the bo- deepest part of the ocean is like four to six kilometers. Yeah. I mean, the average the average depth of today of even the Atlantic is 12,000 feet, whatever that is in kilometers, six million. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> very scientific, yep, thing. pretty close. Uh, 12,000 feet, four just to six for, kilometers, right? Yeah, 12,000 feet is 3.7 kilometers. Right, so there you go. Well, so you have a quarter of it would be, uh, would be ice. Now, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know about the chemistry off the top of my head about the brine. Oh, because I, I've also yeah, read no, a lot I, that, 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 that at the equator, uh, it was like slushy. Not, well, not quite well, ice. Well, well, oh boy! Uh, Here comes we, we C. Could have Peterson such, opening the can of worms. I know we could have had such a nicer transition into that, and he's just like, "No, I'm going, I'm going in." <laughs> so there's uh, there's a pushback with the snowball Earth. So snowball Earth is kind of saying like it was a snowball Earth. Uh, the basically the world, the entire Earth was this Arctic tundra, like totally frozen solid with all these super glaciers all over the place. But there's a rebuttal to that. And actually, from what I've been reading, more people tend to go with the slush ball earth theory, where mm-hmm. the equatorial regions might have had uh, free flowing water or at least slushy water kind of flowing around. So is that what you're getting at, Steve? That's what I was getting at. But... <laughs> So there's a couple, uh, let's see, I know we have some, there's a couple different lines of evidence for, uh, for this, like, uh, for, well, of what was going on for this, uh, you know, the, the snowball earth, but, um, you know, there's basically, you got to look at the life too, of what what was going on in terms of of life on earth. So we knew that there was life on earth during this time period. And here's like the craziest part of this to quote Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park. (laughs) (laughs) I've never done this before. (laughs) (laughs) Or, uh, well, life always finds a way, right? Which is it's, uh, life finds a way. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for correcting me on that. Life finds a way, right? Which is crazy. So there's stuff that survived this, like that basically survived the super glaciers. And there's photosynthetic life that survives the super glaciers. So which makes you think, how the heck does this happen? Was it the slush ball earth where you had just, you know, there was uh, stuff that could have survived in the the free flowing water around the, uh, the equatorial regions? Was it just really like thin ice that allowed some light to penetrate through to allow photosynthesis to keep on going on or did the photosynthetic life just survive on top of the ice or yeah. did the photosynthetic ice only <laughs> survive near <laughs> photosynthetic life only survive near volcanoes that's yeah so that's, you might have hot spots where yeah. you have oases right so or, ba- basically little, little pools of Water and even like say you're say you're at the equator you know you could have look at even look at glaciers today look at greenland today during during the daytime you get sunlight that you get melt pools on top of the ice so you could have you know <clears throat> things surviving say in these melt pools that freezes up overnight or whatnot. But you also have maybe chemotrophs in the deep sea. But, you know, we have things that live at or near black smokers today along yeah, the Yeah, but rim. Chris was saying it was photosynthetic, though. Oh, so yes. yeah, it has to be. Yeah, Sorry. photosynthesis evolved before. Sorry. 
this. I mean, like it did. It, it certainly did. Um, <clears throat> this is, you know, the the first like complex life starts evolving almost right before this. You get sponges. And man, evol- they are hardy animals. They are. They're when crazy. I, I've read some things like because they wear square about- pants. It's- <laughs> You, I'm going to ignore that. And when, yeah. you read, when you read about Snowball Earth, you'll read a lot of stuff about it. It'll get into the life. Basically, how the heck does life survive? And you start reading some things about how sponges are pretty much indestructible. Yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about animals that save the planet? Sponges. Sponges. <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, they're, they're more resilient than the cockroaches. Uh, yeah. I'd take a sponge any day. <laughs> I was... I was in the basement of, of our building at <clears> that temple. And there was a, there was a dead cockroach that's on the back dead. And I was like, is this like a coal mine? Should I abandon the uh, building here? It, it's the other day I was walking in the class and I saw one that was kind of like walking crazy. And I was like, ah, I'm just going to leave it. it leave it makes it. And then when I came back after class, like three hours later, it was just, twitching i was like i i don't know what they spray in here like this can't be good (laughs) well anyway i gave him i gave him a fighting chance he did not win (laughs) or she i don't i didn't check the gender of the cockroach sorry but but yeah it's it's an it is a question you know sometimes we we focus so much on how did it begin and and how did it end you don't think about the sort of the middle portion here of like what's going on during snowball earth how is life surviving and it's easy enough to for chemotrophs or i guess uh what what would you call a chemolithotrophs the organisms that live off of minerals essentially um it's easy enough to to claim that but yeah I, until we started talking about this, I had never thought about the photosynthesizers. But I, I, I think there's enough sort of these patchy areas. It's, this isn't like we're talking about the ice planet Hoth here. You, you're going to have um, little oases and little broken patches. And, the, and whenever I heard about Snowball Earth, I was always told that the ocean is freezing but whether or not the ocean froze right at the equator in the tropics is still sort of debatable. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, so one of the, the <clears throat> I already mentioned Paul Hoffman, who is sort of like, I don't know, the, the snowball's biggest proponent. <clears throat> His argument against the slush ball scenario and in his, his words here, carbon would, would start building up very quickly. So the glaciation would be very short-lived and the ice would retreat gradually because of this. And so in the geologic record, that's, that's not what we see. You know, the first uh, glaciation, the first snowball lasted 58 million years, which is sort of inconsistent with this idea. Also with these glaciations, they end very abruptly, at least in the rock record. Again, this is 717 yeah. million years ago. Not great resolution. Not great resolution. So to say they terminate abruptly is uh, that's you. I feel like you're not you're, you're not um, stopping so, on a dime. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to think of a tactful way to say like you're not being like you're not telling the whole story here no the the resolution of it of the time frame is yeah one oh i forgot to mention this when we were talking about the mechanisms to get us into this the franklin large igneous provinces we we do date those those basalts those lips as we call them large igneous provinces so franklin lips uh they <laughs> They're dated between um, 719 to 717 million years ago. And the onset of, of Snowball Earth is like 717. Oh, so, I, I, I thought that 
I, I, I would, my own source was saying that it was a couple million years before uh, the onset of well, the, the well, yeah, first. 719 would be a couple million years before 717. Uh, gotcha. I'm no math well, major, he's but he's got you there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. And, and that's part of, that's, that is the part of, that's the main issue here is sort of like we're, we have this, everything is so, long ago that we have oh it's very fuzzy what's a million years here or there when it's 700 million years ago it's true right yeah yeah but a million years is a long time for the planet to heat up or cool down a million years is longer than modern humans have been around on this planet yeah so how do we know there were these glaciers here are we just kind of shooting Shooting at the hip right now, just saying like, "Hey, Oof. glaciers oh. sound great." Is there any, any? We got any hard evidence of these glaciers? Got a, got a few lines. All right, we're, we're, uh, we're... ice. Hard evidence. The ice. Uh, the ice is still here. <laughs> Have you looked outside? It's cold. Uh, <clears throat> it's not true. It was really hot today. So we have some some evidence in the rock record, which is our favorite type of record. Um really the only record we got from back then it, it really is yeah um, Vi- vinyl wasn't around yet no. Hi-yo. ignore him ladies and gentlemen Calm. <laughs> so we we have and and a lot of this there's dispute because the record is especially the stratigraphic record the record you know what we have in in the layers of of the geology because it is sort of spotty and and you're relying on sort of connecting dots here but we have things like drop stones into marine sediments, which tell us that there's, you know, glaciers or um, icebergs breaking off, carrying rock, terrestrial material. And as these icebergs float out into the ocean, you see this today, you know, icebergs break off Greenland or Antarctica and they float down. And, you know, if it's coming off Greenland, bumps into the Titanic and then it keeps floating. And eventually as it floats <laughs> south, it melts. And so whatever material it, it had grinded up as the glacier moved across the land, it melts out with it and drops onto marine sediment. And marine sediment is very boring. I was just going to say boring. <laughs> <laughs> I and really it, like marine, like we're talking like abyssal plain. Yeah. It's just, it's just like it's, mud. It's just, it's like dust yeah. yeah, like in the Atlantic Ocean, it's like dust blowing off from the Sahara Desert, you know. Uh, just it's just dead, pelagic. Dead things yeah, dying. Yeah, like yeah, and the dead plankton, things are just, forams and just... Yeah, single cell dead things. Yeah. So if you get yeah. a giant boulder in the yeah. middle of, of all of this... Oh, uh, what? what? <laughs> yeah, it got and, brought in. And so, I've actually mapped this and seen this in the rock record, you know, terrestrially in idaho where it's like okay you have all these sediments you have all this stuff and it's like where the hell did this boulder come from like this doesn't make any sense now obviously these are alpine glaciers that i'm talking about but but the same thing happens where you get a big giant ice dam built up and then it bursts and then these icebergs can carry bus sized boulders like you know tens of kilometers away and then drop them down and so on land we call them erratics yes but in i do love the name drop stone because it's one you of those what? things where we're just like hey what's this it's a stone that dropped <laughs> i've Done. never that's so f- i i moving never, on i've never like i know obviously i know what erratics are and i know what drop stones are but i never put two and two together that erratics and drop stones like erratics just on land and drop stones are just <laughs> kind of the same thing in water roughly that's interesting. Yeah. yeah interesting yeah so we i mean we have your normal we have some other your normal things like varves and striations um anyway so you got you got you get these your normal sort of sedimentary deposits my favorite is that during snowball earth during this time period you get the return of biff ah biff's hello. back baby uh so you get banded it's the only time after the initial sort of oxygen revolution where you get uh banded iron formations 
And so banded iron formations oh. ju just as a, oh, sorry, what were you gonna? Oh, I was just gonna say the same thing you're saying. Oh, but Continue. so banded yes. iron just as, as, a, as a reminder. So in the early earth, there's no oxygen in the atmosphere. So and iron is at this point in the ocean soluble. It's just, it's in solution. And as soon as photosynthesizers evolve, you start getting oxygen into the atmosphere and that oxygen um, is getting into the ocean water and it's, it's oxidizing that soluble iron. And so once the iron oxidizes, it precipitates out. Yeah, you're, you're rusting the ocean. Yeah. And so you have, we have these layers of just iron oxide, iron, iron ore, essentially. So all of the iron ore we have on our planet comes roughly from these, this, this interval early on in the earth, like 3 billion years ago. And it, um, it, it, it's from the oxygen revolution, but you also see it at this time because, you know, <clears throat> To get these iron rich rocks deposited, you would need an anoxic ocean. And so you, you have the, this, uh, if, if the oceans froze over, you would get it, it, these anoxic conditions because there would be very limited gas exchange with the oxygen that's in the atmosphere. So the reappearance of BIFs in the sedimentary record is what people who are in favor of snowball earth say is, is that there's, there's such limited oxygen in the ocean because it's been frozen over that you get these biffs. Which is crazy. Like, yeah. And obviously we don't, we don't get biffs forming anymore um, on earth, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just indicator that the, of anoxic events. So, um, so they're showing up. Finally, uh, carbonate, a uh, cap carbonate rocks. Big one. So, um, you know, to tell you the truth, I, if one of you guys want to take this, cause I got some questions about how the, about these things. Yeah. I, I mean, this always confused me when, when I did snowball earth, I'll just, <clears throat> I can summarize it here unless you want yeah, to just, uh, Yeah. Just go basic summary. So, um, Essentially, at the at the at the end of of what we would consider the, the glacial conditions or the glacial sediments, what we see are these huge uh, deposits of limestone or dolostone that are meters to tens of meters thick. So it tells us something in the ocean water changed uh -huh. in that how things are precipitating out, um, and so one of the ideas here is that if you had um, a lot of water flushing into the ocean at this time, so say everything starts melting, all of the ice starts melting, it's all this water is flushing in, so that would cause intense weathering, um, which would bring a lot of the ions needed, a lot of the calcium um, uh, needed to, to, to start start this process. And, and so if you're melting out of this, you get a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is gonna react uh, <clears throat> uh, into um, uh, carbonic acid, which is gonna cause weathering on land, mm -hmm. bringing more carbonate, uh, the, the ions necessary to form these carbonates into the ocean. So uh, essentially the idea here is that if the world is warming, you're, you're gonna weather and bring all the ions you need and, and life is gonna start to flourish in the ocean and it's going to uh, precipitate out, it's gonna use these ions and precipitate out carbonate. And we, you know, we see this today in warm water areas, mm -hmm. yeah, carbonates forming. Yeah, like the Bahamas or- Yeah, exactly, the Bahamas. Yeah, yeah are... so the, the, I guess the idea here is that that you're at the end of these glacial sediments, you have these huge caps of carbonate, hence cap carbonate. And it, it, it the people in favor of this idea suggest it, it's a return to the 
warm warming world where carbonates can form hmm. it's you, heating up you don't really get carbonates forming in in cold conditions yeah usually yeah carbonates are whenever you th- like generally speaking whenever you think of carbonate formation just think of the bahamas like that's like the yeah. carbonate factory on earth right now so yeah so i mean field there's, trip there's i mean there's issues with this idea that you know in that if you did have high co2 and you're forming all this carbonic acid well that it makes uh, things acidic which dissolves carbonates right so um also you know there's some people have run the numbers and said all right well the thickness doesn't necessarily match up with what you would actually produce in a in a rapid deglaciation um and there there's some other issues with the stratigraphy of where you find the carbonates but again it's tough because it was 600 700 million years ago Mm -hmm. to say for sure yeah yeah so yeah, that kind of well, that kind of caps it all off. And then to, you know, kind of another thing that we have here <laughs> was that a pun? <laughs> basically, <laughs> another thing that we have here is kind of going back, and might, this might be a little bit out of order, but you know, at first, like I guess in talking about in terms of like criticisms and things like that, which was this is kind of interesting. At first, it was so preposterous that the equatorial latitudes froze over that geologists originally thought that the earth had tipped over and that like, like basically the equator was running like North South. And that was the explanation on how the, how the equator froze over. What and, is, they call that like extreme obliquity where the tilt is like, well, like, oh, 90 I, degree tilt. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, you, you think about it, like, what is it? Uh, what? The easiest explanation that would make sense that I mean, the I don't earth know, just kind of tipped for a little while and for a little while i mean like a million I don't know years easiest, like it, i mean uranus uh, rotates on its side right like it it's not you know let's not go knocking these scientists that that would that would fit the explanation that would explain everything if that yeah, was true i feel but. like that's that's like wegner trying to explain continental drift with tides though right exactly like the numbers no, I, just the numbers don't work I get it. I'm just saying if somebody would present that to me today, I'd be like, all right, I'll listen, prove it. Like, so if you were a betting, betting man, I'm not, how would, how would you get us out of green, uh, uh, snowball of earth? Uh, cows, cows burp a lot. They fart a lot. I do greenhouse gas. We're done. I'm no, I'm certainly no evolutionary biologist, but I'm pretty sure the tree of life does go sponge cow. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I you there goes my hypothesis. <laughs> All right. I I'd like to see a, a cow sponge. I mean, a we, cow sponge. We might be all, we might be missing about 650 million years of evolution. Yeah, but yeah true. But uh, uh 550 no, I, maybe. 550. I, I do I do have a, a legit guess of volcanoes. Steve, I think you might have something there. Yeah. Volcanoes might have gotten us out. Volcanoes of in the shape of a cow. Snowball <laughs> earth. Yes. Cow volcanoes. Yeah. Um, so volcanic activity releases CO2 and warms up the climate. So eventually it, it kind of, you know, we get this, we're going to, we get this release of CO2. So it's warming up the climate, but here's another line of criticism for, for snowball earth there would have to be a crap ton of CO2 released into the atmosphere. And there's some people that are saying that we just really aren't seeing the numbers in the rock record for the amount of CO2 that would have, uh, have to have been released. Um, you know, but basically what happens is the, uh, the volcanic activity is going to release that CO2 uh, and the rock that would end up weathering out and suck up that CO2 Guess where that was at? It was under the ice. Ah, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, Rock? The Get answer out. was there you, the you, whole time. <laughs> You're under the ice. But then I guess you could say like, well, it's been under the ice for 10 million years. Why all of a sudden is it making a difference now? 
anyways um but, but yeah so play the the interior of the earth is still the interior of the earth yes is it is it got a slightly colder jacket on yeah but there's still plate tectonics is still evolving uh, volcanoes are still erupting like i mean it does- i even i even came i'm sorry to interrupt you see but i even came no. across some thing some things in the in the literature some there were some hypotheses that are saying the only reason the oceans didn't or one of the reasons that the oceans didn't completely freeze over is because of the internal heat of the earth some people are even thinking oh. which is dude, but, when you get to that point like, yeah i'm not sure i I'm guess sure i don't know because like the bottoms of the oceans are still really cold. They're still, yeah, they're yeah two but, degrees but Celsius. How, how cold was it 700 million years ago, though? Uh, yeah, you're right. It should still be cold because, you know, we were hot 4 billion years ago, but <laughs> yeah. Not, anyway, not, so, not guess, so hot when you're, you know, 4 billion years old, are you? So, <laughs> <laughs> so in order to in order to overcome this runaway like freezing of the earth we well not we like any one of us but the volcanoes would have to release so much co2 into the atmosphere today and they're talking about orders of like about 350 times the amount of carbon dioxide that we see in the atmosphere today and this would take tens of millions of years and which kind of lines up with the the glacial cycles that we're seeing for for the the snowball earth stuff so uh you know uh so over a time period of let's see four to 30 million years enough carbon dioxide and methane mostly emitted by the volcanoes but also you had some some microbial activity get kind of um which converted organic carbon trapped under the ice into gas that stuff accumulated to finally cause enough greenhouse effect to make the surface ice melt in the tropics until we get this band of permanently ice-free land and water developed, right? Now, talking about the albedo effect, this would be yeah, darker like than the ice. The reverse albedo effect. Now it's yeah. like, okay, it's kind of like we're punching through. We open up, you know, open up that hole and boom. Now we start initiating this positive melting positive feedback of, of melting yeah so the so the, you expose ocean water which is darker so it absorbs more energy which heats up the water which melts more ice which exposes more ocean which absorbs more sunlight which heats up more and so on and so forth and you're off and running there we go that's the start that's all that's all we needed to start it off and um so what what's to say about the uh, the ocean nutrients here yeah, yeah. So it, it the timing of this is pretty incredible because coming out of, I mean, again, <clears throat> when you get into there's this interesting thing that happens when the further back you go, and this happens, this happens in, in human history, let alone geologic history, is that you have the you you compress time, right? The further back you go, the more you compress events. It's like the idea of, you know, you, you think about events in history. Think about the, I don't know, the example, I don't know why this is the example that comes to my mind, but the Hundred Years' War in, in England and between England and France was, was a series of, of battles, you know, they, over this 116 year period, there was more periods of peace than there were wars, but there were these series of battles. And so we compress it and just call it the Hundred Years' War. The people alive, they may have experienced w- one battle that happened in their lifetime or something. We, yeah. we have this ability to compress time. And so the same thing, I, I, I hesitate to talk about this, but the same thing might be happening here. But it is really interesting, the timing, in that you come out of Snowball Earth and the next period after Snowball Earth is... The, the Cambrian explosion. Boom. Where life is radiating. The radiation. Sponges are no longer the, the kings and queens of the ocean. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard sponges being referred to as the kings and queens of the oceans. <laughs> yeah. Wait, are sponges asexual? I think so. Yeah, they bud. So, so. that it would just be 
the non-gender ruler yeah the just ruler of the ocean that's yeah you're right <laughs> they are <clears throat> just a yeah so you have this this a huge radiation of of life and multicellular life and so one of the ideas is that because you're weathering and and you've pent up all of this you've ground up all of this earth with the movement of these ice sheets and then it all melts you're, you're you have this huge pulse of of nutrients like phosphorus and and other things <clears throat> that can result in and say cyanobacteria exploding, which would cause the oxygens to get back into the ocean and the atmosphere. And so there's some thought that it, it gives rise to the Ediacaran and then into the Cambrian explosion. So it was just like, you know, you got to think up into this until this period, we did not really have complicated life on Earth. It was all you know, kind of yeah pretty pretty simple stuff and so you know for the first four billion years of the earth we've just been kind of setting the stage for this explosion of life this explosion of complicated life and you know it's kind of like it, you know the first thing we had to do cool down the earth right and then we had to get an atmosphere that wasn't fill with like really like you know toxic stuff for for modern <laughs> life you know let's get some oxygen in there first and then we'll talk you know just like, a little just give us something right <laughs> so get some oxygen in there and now when you get the oxygen on in the atmosphere oh everything's frozen by the way it's like <laughs> darn it it's like so close <laughs> too and much too much finally finally the ice belts and you're like am i good is yeah. that it all well, right we're good that's oh, we hit the ground running yeah and that's the thing like you you to, to usually and in, in when we've seen these evolutionary events there's been some sort of perturbation something is pushing it you know it's sometimes it's a die-off sometimes you know you get hit by an asteroid and it kills off 80 percent of the life so you get this evolutionary event that, that causes things to flourish in this case it looks to be that you just had to freeze the entire planet first. That so was that, the push. That was the reset. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And then, uh, yeah. but the other thing though, um, just to kind of finish this off, you know, you might think like, well, okay. So we start getting stuck in these cycles of these, like of the super glaciers. And then, and then all of a sudden it frees out and, like we said, there was at least two, potentially like four of these larger, of these like, of these huge, you know, snowball earth glacial pushes. But what eventually ends up happening is Rodinia breaks up and Rodinia moves away from the equator and that's it. And now you're away from the equator and potentially just that extra push of just tons and tons of chemical weathering occurring at the, or not, yeah. Tons and tons of just weather, I guess you could say, occurring at the equator. It's not happening as rapid as, as it used to once those continents split up and move away from the equator. And that was kind of it. That's that's it. <clears throat> so that's, uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, I, that pretty much uh, covers Snowball Earth there. I, <laughs> I agree, man. That was great. Yeah. Chilling episode. I, uh, <laughs> I will, I, I'll give a little a side story about Jesse. As, You're talking in the third person right now. Yeah. As, okay. as an undergrad, after I figured out what I wanted to do in life, you know, <clears throat> I got into geology and, and I was like, oh yeah, this is great. I, li I like this. this. is all right. And, but I still wanted to, I was going to go into some sort of industry, <clears throat> but I read a book by Gabrielle Walker called Snowball Earth. I've always wanted to read this book. I've, and, it's on my to-do list to read this book. And it sort of made me recognize how cool doing research was. It how may have cool? given me, oh, gosh. <laughs> But it, it also may have it may have lied to me a bit about 
making research sound a lot more exciting than it <laughs> might actually be. Yes. But, but it, it uh, sort of let me that down. Book. Led me sat down in the... the lab today for seven hours. <laughs> yeah. I led sifted the four samples. Academia. So I'd recommend it. It's, it's an interesting book. Very I cool. also read the book to put off, I think, doing work that I was supposed to be doing. Uh, that's, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Nice. Well, so, uh, seriously, thank you all to our Patreon listeners who are out there listening to us live right now and or the ones who are going to listen to this later. Um, we literally couldn't do this without you. Uh, thanks again to the Formatic Formula, um, who we literally couldn't get this out to all of our <laughs> Patreons without you. Um, check us out on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, what am I missing? Um, Twitter and I don't know, YouTube, YouTube, uh, our friend Kelly Blake posted us on LinkedIn, which we're getting a lot of likes on our women in geology podcast. So if you're on LinkedIn, check that out. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so if you want to, if you want to help out the podcast, we have, uh, several different levels of subscriptions on Patreon, uh, the lowest tier being a talc tier starting as as little as two dollars a month so if you like the podcast and you got a couple 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 dollars a month to to um to expend uh we'd, you know that would that would be great you can help us it's, yeah it's, we'll we'll send you some stickers and you can also some buy stickers, some yeah. some merch on our website yeah yeah so it's geologyflannelcast.com um check out the merch section on there you can you get some coffee mugs we got some t-shirts stick you can you can buy some stickers there too very very reasonably priced and uh t-shirts hoodies that yeah the stickers are so cheap we almost lose money <laughs> we're pretty close we're not really making any money off this <laughs> so but yeah please uh thank you very much and uh y- you know we're coming up on the month of may so it's uh for mother's day tell your mom about the flannel cast may i'm trying to think of something off the top Bet- of my head better than that that's better than that and tell you <laughs> Tell, tell your mate. Them. Hey, yeah. S- say hello to your mom. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's... say hello to your mom for me. That's from <laughs> uh, Back to the Future, another right. 80s movie. So. Well, thanks. Thanks again. Once again, to our Patreon sponsors. Thanks again for everyone listening. We love you guys. Uh, and that concludes the last podcast of April. We'll see you guys in May. All right. Take care. See you later. Bye. bye. Oh, bye. Thanks for stopping. Bye.